Welcome back to the panel's choice. Here we ask each panel member to pick a topic from this week that they feel is important to discuss. We'll start with Donna's pick. Last week, Attorney General Merrick Garland turned the FBI against parents, labeling them as domestic terrorists for opposing mask mandates or critical race theory. Donna, you bring an interesting comparison of what we're seeing today to the 1956 FBI counterintelligence program, which was used to target people such as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and other civil rights leaders. At the time, the DOJ claimed they were weeding out extremists. Sound familiar? It sounds very familiar, and people should realize that that's what this effort is. They're targeting conservatives and parents the same way they did in, 19, uh, in, in the 1960s. They used the narrative that Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders were black nationalists, black extremists, and they used that as an effort to be able to spy on them and discredit them in their efforts to um, actually gain freedoms. And they're doing the same things with the parents today and conservatives. Notice, we're called white nationalists, extremists, and they're using that to dis try to discredit and disrupt, and, and disrupt our efforts. I love how you say we're called white nationalists we, when you lump we, yourself into that category. <laughs> well, I remember uh, Larry Elder was the black face of white supremacy. <laughs> I'm still considered a white nationalist because I'm a black, conservative, evangelical Christian. So they, that's when we sort of dispel who we are and we're supposed to be the black face of white supremacy. It's just, it boggles the mind. It's a feat of mental gymnastics to try to figure out the logic that's used on this, this theory. What do you think parents need to be doing in order to push back against this? I think you, you, you still have to, don't give up because let me tell you, the Department of Justice and the FBI always targets people that have a different political lean than they have. This is an effort to destroy any rights that individuals have or want to have that oppose them. And right. so if you don't stand up and say, you know, go ahead and put me in jail, go ahead and call me whatever you want, then they'll continue this witch hunt as long as they think that we're afraid. And right. that's what you saw during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. They, you know, one of the things that was so compelling to me is the Freedom Riders, they had said their goodbyes to their family. They wrote their wheels out. Right. And they said that they would not stop and they would go to their, to that, the sit-in in the counters. Right. And so when you're not afraid, then that's how you win, is David right. and Goliath, and we'll win. <laughs> you got it. Donna, the white nationalist. Yes. Thanks for the topic. <laughs> Next, we have Chris Farrell's pick. Leading up to the 2020 election, President Trump would lead rally cheers with the question, where's Hunter? It would get quite raucous. Other than OAN, there's not any real coverage of the Biden family corruption. Here's why Hunter Biden should still be a concern. Chris, did Hunter really say if his dad wins the presidency, he'll make a gazillion dollars? He did, and he did so on a videotape available on Rumble where he is in a bedroom with a, purportedly with a prostitute. He's on a week-long binge of drugs and prostitution, right. and he's bragging to her that his dad's going to become elected president and he's going to make a gazillion dollars. Now, line that up with the fact that Hunter Biden is currently under investigation by the IRS for tax improprieties uh, and revelations just this week that Hunter Biden and President Biden share a checking account. Oh my gosh. And so there's, there are emails that have been published, uh, I think Daily Mail's the, the, the folks that published it, showing the back and forth between Hunter Biden's business manager discussing, hey, we got a bill for this amount of money we're going to pay it out of your joint account with your dad. We don't need to tell him, do we? And, oh, we got a refund from this account. Uh, that brings the level of the amount of money up to this. Should we tell your dad or not? So there is documentation of this joint financial, this checking account between Hunter and his father. Uh, if Hunter's under investigation criminally by the federal government, Shouldn't his joint checking account holder be under investigation as well? Well, maybe if it's over six hundred dollars, <laughs> they'll actually take a look at it. But yeah. that's in that's infuriating. How 
how can the FBI or any federal investigator have any sense of integrity when they're allowing something like this to go forward? Well, it's the same federal investigators who sat on Hunter Biden's laptops mm -hmm. uh, at the exact same time that the House was impeaching then-President Trump over Ukraine. If you looked for Ukrainian corruption, you had Hunter Biden's laptops. Mm -hmm. They picked it up in November, December of that year, which is the exact same time that the president was being impeached. Right. What did DOJ or the FBI do with Hunter Biden's laptops? They buried it. When they knew there was all sorts of incriminating information on those laptops, and they knew the entire phony narrative by the punk Vindman who filed this, was in, involved yep. in this phony uh, whistleblower claim with Eric Chia Morelli, his buddy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the false whistleblowers drum up a claim against the president. They impeach him over it. And our illustrious Department of Justice and FBI sit on their hands and do nothing when they know they have evidence of, of 180 degrees opposite going on of President Biden and his son and all sorts of shenanigans in the Ukraine. It's infuriating. Thank you so much for the topic. Let's go to Malik's pick. Republicans have come under fire for making changes in state election laws. But in Georgia this week, two election workers were accused of shredding around 300 voter registration forms. Obviously, Georgia is already under scrutiny for its handling of the 2020 election. And now it seems this November may have some bad irregularities as well. Malik, tell us about it. I am here to talk about voter suppression. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you said, what happened is, is that there were about 300 or so um, applications that were destroyed, shredded by election workers. Now in Georgia, I will say that you, know, you don't re register by party registration. It's in Fulton County. We can legitimately assume, because it's um, Fulton County, that those probably were, um, you know, they probably would vote Democrat anyway. Now, the thing is, is that this is part of the larger discussion of what Republicans have been doing in areas all around the country. So when you're talking about really shoring up our um, or election, election integ integrity and things like that, this is a very good example of that because there were steps that Georgia took. Even though the law was criticized itself, there were steps that Georgia took to make sure that these things like this do don't happen. Over the past 20 or so years, Fulton County has been notorious across the board, election after election, whether it's at the presidential level, statewide level, or local level, Fulton County has been um, ground zero for problems in Georgia. Right. And I'm sure many of us remember what happened after um, in the 2020 election. where And oh, the 2021 election. And the 2021 election. Yep. So this is just part and parcel of what has happened there in Fulton County. What the, um, but the process worked. There were um, workers who actually reported those two election workers and then they were fired the i think the county or election commission or whatever it's called they did send that up in raffensburger raffensburger, Ra raffensburger. He actually um, is now calling on the DOJ to investigate this because he says that this has been a problem in, in Fulton County, particularly for a very long time. But the interesting thing to me about it is that we haven't heard anything from the media. Yeah, no, they're, they're trying to bury it, just like they're burying the same thing happening in Michigan this week. Michigan also is prosecuting three individuals. The funny, the uh, Wall Street Journal headline said, uh, something to the effect of there's indictments or voter fraud found in Michigan, but it doesn't confirm Trump's suspicions or it doesn't, it doesn't fit Trump's narratives. It's like, no, it, it actually does. But yeah, yeah it, it's been hard to find. But thank you for the topic. And last but not least, we have Dr. Shay's pick. There is a worldwide effort by media outlets to vilify the unvaccinated. Take a look at this clip from Melbourne. These people are against mandatory vaccination and lockdowns. I don't feel like parents should be forced to put their kids in this position. This one is an experiment. It hasn't even been found if it's safe. Mandatory vaccinations are against the Australian Constitution. There must, there must be informed consent. The group gathered at busy intersections and held signs. This man says he's out of work because he's refusing to be vaccinated. Still don't have a job. Still don't have no money. How am I meant to get money? We know from past demonstrations it's protests like these where the virus is transmitted. For largely unvaccinated crowds like this one, it's dangerous and it's likely people here will get sick. 
Interesting she makes that comment. While she's got the mask down <laughs> around her chin, she's clearly terrified she's of terrified. the environment. Dr. Shea, tell us about your paper. So this is uh, an example of what federal overreach can do for a Western country. This isn't China. This is Australia. Um, supposedly has the same sort of roots and in individual liberties that the United States does. What you don't see there is that a few peaceful demonstrators standing on some street corners in Australia, Australian citizens, were swarmed by police and arrested. And the police told them that being outside to demonstrate was not an approved reason to be outside. Right. Um, that, that's, I mean, it's Australia, but in the United States, we're seeing similar things like that. But what about are. our right to peacefully assemble? Or right, what about our right to be outside? Well, this is why we need to be careful. This should be a warning to us, which brings right. me to uh, President Biden's so-called vaccine mandate. Um, when I think about this, I, I just want us to put this in perspective. What has happened so far is he has had a press conference where he announced that he had a plan for vaccination. Um, he also said that he was losing his patience yeah. with the unvaccinated, which I think is a, an audacious authoritarian statement, frankly. It is. Um, but what we've seen so far is OSHA has not published any guidelines um, that would tell corporations how to implement the so-called mandate. Um, federal agencies, I have on very good authority, I've actually put my eyes on the documents, um, that federal agencies have been told, some of them at least, to pause on this because they are overwhelmed with exemption waivers and so they've, the implementation pause. Let's also, again, perspective, there's no congressional law in this. Right. So this is just really opinion, but I think that this is somewhat of a political bluff by the Biden administration. If you'll look at a bunch of different issues, they see just how far they can push us to take away our civil liberties. Yeah. And I think we need to continue to push back. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. When we come back from the break, we've got Don't Be Fooled in my closing argument. We'll be right back.